All right, so today we're going to look at a chapter of um, my mm -hmm. PhD thesis. Um, and so, which I've called Theophic Relations is the name of it, the chapter. And it is a, a chapter about ecclesiology. Um, the thesis was written as a critique and development of what's known as Eucharistic ecclesiology. That is prevalent among Orthodox theologians at the present time, especially presented by Metropolitan John Zizioulis. Um, so while not dismissing the importance or centrality of the Eucharist, this thesis provides a different perspective on its place in ecclesiology and how are we to understand ecclesiology. The chapter being discussed is the development in theory of what is derived from the scriptures, the ecumenical councils, and the fathers. Due to the space and focus of this chapter, I will not be making regular references to the source materials, although there is often allusion to them throughout the presentation. The scriptural and patristic background can be obtained through reading the earlier chapters of dissertations, should it so please you, um, especially chapter two. Just to clarify some terminology during the presentation, firstly, the phrase theotic relations is something coined during the writing of a dissertation to provide us a, a label for the concepts being addressed. So it is, will be rather new to many. The meaning of this phrase, hopefully, will be brought out during the presentation. Next, when speaking of local church, I'm referring to the church of a city or a diocese in modern usage that is a gathering of a faith from about a bishop in each city or place. There's a wider and deeper question about this usage that will be addressed later. When speaking of hierarchy, I'm using this term in a wider sense to encompass a general priesthood in all its orders from reader to bishop and the rankings of bishops from a bishop to patriarch. Mostly the emphasis will be on the priesthood proper of presbyters and bishops when used in the local context or the overall network of bishops in the wider context. I generally use the Greek derived term hypostasis to refer to each of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as they exist uniquely in three manners of existence. The common English usage of person is too open to misunderstanding due to modern notions of person, especially in the context of this thesis. Also, when speaking of nature, I'm generally speaking of the essence of God inclusive of the operations or energies proper to that essence. I will I make a distinction between public and private spheres, which is important for the addressing of this topic. Public spheres include the general governance of a nation or a village at a political level, or the governance of a local church or parish or regional churches where people from different households come together. The private sphere is that of each family household or monastic house as distinct from a personal sphere, which is sort of an individual, depends to the individual. I, you will use pronouns in a classical sense in using a male form as inclusive of a female and this qualified otherwise implicitly by context or explicitly. This may not be the practice that we see today, um, but it's done because of the nature of the topic of the thesis is such that the modern usage is not an appropriate way of expressing the conceptual issues. And finally, when referring to the practices of a church, I'm referring to them in their canonical norm as practiced in the history of the church. This may well not be the practice which we see today. So while suggesting a normative value to certain practices in line with this thesis, I'm not making a judgment on any particular practice today because having a norm while having a normative basis, the practice of the church is exercised to a degree in economy for particular reasons, and so may, for good reason, not necessarily conform exactly to normative or canonical practice. 
Right. Well, the theological principles upon which this thesis was developed will now be laid out. And then an outline of the notion of theotic relations as presented in the chapter being discussed today. Firstly, we begin with God and our theological definitions of him because ecclesiology must, at its core, be grounded in God. For the purposes of this thesis, God is understood as a rational being with will and work, who is free and has authority. He is eternally active, he is good, and he is love. God, in three hypostases, has one essence and one operation, and one will. God is pure and one, without division or, that, or anything contrary. And God cannot deny himself. Secondly, we understand that the second epistasis of God, the Son of God, was incarnated to unite human humanity to God and through humanity all creation. Christ unites to humanity both in soul and body and sends them both into the heavens. That is from a fixed point in space and time to transcend any limits of space and time. We understand Christ's two natures, two wills, and two operations, or energies proper to each nature. Secondly, we under, thirdly, we understand that a man has created the image of God. That is, he also is a rational being with will and word, who is free and has authority, and is able to be good and to love. Man is created to exist in the likeness of God, as one with God and with other men. Man cannot exist of himself, but only as sustained by God. <coughs> the image of God chiefly refers to governance and authority, as explains St. John Chrysostom in his second homily in Genesis. Man is created to govern or rule with God. This is understood as the core basis of Christian anthropology. We also recognize the fall of man through disobedience, a breach of unity of will of God leading to death, and that the path to reconciliation with God is through obedience. Creation is also not presently in its proper state in relation to God, but in a temporary state heading towards that final end. Thus, there is a distinction between practice proper to the present situation and that proper to the coming age. As a note here, freedom is understood as free from any exterior compulsion, even good. That is, one so free is able to reject even what is clearly in one's own best interest and in a sense one's own freedom. That is because God is free from any principle beyond himself. He is not good because some principle exists that God must be good, but because he freely is good of himself, or rather defines what, it, what is good in himself. So man to participate in his likeness must do so without any compulsion, even from God. Fourthly, we understand the theology of icons, that honor and reverence passes through the image to the prototype, who is, in a way, according to epistasis, present in his image. This principle is extended from painted images to humans as living images of God. Fifthly, we understand the distinction between the essence and the operations or energies of God. We understand that one can participate in God and unite to God according to his operations in synergy, whilst yet remaining distinct according to essence or being. We also understand God is truly known through his operations and energies. Overall, we require the theological basis that defines an orthodox Christian according to faith. Apart from this theological foundation, one cannot arrive at the notion of theotic relations and how they form the basis of ecclesiology. Now to address theosis. As noted above, for man to exist eternally, he must participate in the existence of God in union with God, 
because there can be no eternal existence of itself separate from God, nor eternal existence contrary to God. Anything so existing at present is only temporarily so, as required to permit as many as God desires to participate with him eternally. Union with God is to conform to the likeness of God according to his image. That is, we reunite to God as a trihypostatic rational being in freedom of authority. We participate in him not as objects, but as subjects, as reigning with God, exercising our wills freely. As such, to do so, we must be of one will with God. That is, as subjects, we must act in unity as one with God. The act of uniting to the singular will of God is for the creature one of conforming one's will to that of God. That for rational beings of authority means obedience to the laws or testimonies of God, which appeal to reason and freedom rather than compulsion or instinct. The one will of God, though, does not exclude the will of the creature, lest the image of God be denied in that creature. So union with the one will of God is also established in exercising one's own will with the consent of God. In obedience, the will of God becomes one's own will, and the consent of our will becomes God's will. In both cases, the will is unified into one. We unite to God as adopted sons of God, with a son with the Holy Spirit from the Father abiding in us, as it abides in the Son, who only does what the Father does and wills what the Father wills. Apart from the Son and the Spirit, there can be no relation to the Father. Thus, union with God requires union with the Son and attainment of the Holy Spirit as sons of God. Now to move on to theotic relations. Because God is intangible according to the physical nature of man, the process of union with God is expressed through tangible human relations. We know God through the image of God, especially the image of God incarnate Christ. Thus, through obedience and union with another human, one can effect union with God. This is not only a means of union, but the primary mean of union with God, because only through such tangible relations can one distinguish obedience to the other from obedience to oneself. So union with God is effected through the tangible human relations. These are what have been coined as theotic relations. Those in union with God are known as the church. And so the church is itself formed by these relations. The primary indicator of our union with the church is our participation in these relations. We have many human relations, and not all of them lead to union with God, such that a group of humans defined as those rejecting God is not a context for relations that unite to God because these relations seek to separate from God. So the relations uniting God must be qualified in some manner beyond human relations in themselves. So then, these unifying relations as being those of the church are specific relations to those established in the church as appointed by Christ. The first such appointments are the apostles. And on these, we have the foundations of the church in terms of relations. Thus, being united to the church is to be gathered on the foundation of the apostles, with Christ being the chief cornerstone. The apostles, having only lived a number of years, are no longer here tangibly. So, union with the church is continued through those in turn appointed by them the hierarchy of the church, primarily the elders or over the presbyters or overseers bishops, the fathers of the church. These appointments are not simply as human, but as humans through whom one unites to God. Christ is the one through whom we unite to God. And so these appointments are not merely as men, 
but as living icons of the presence of Christ tangible through them. This requires a special type of appointment, ordination, in which Christ becomes present through the one ordained in union with him. So union with the church is through union with those ordained in the church as a mystery of presenting Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit. That is the hierarchy of the church, the bishops, presbyters, and deacons as heads or fathers of the church. In turn, union with these fathers is not simply affected through a human manner because the union is not merely at a human level, but with God. So the union of a faithful of the hierarchy is also through the mysteries of the church, in particular baptism, chrismation, and the Eucharist that establish Christ in the faithful and the faithful in Christ, or rather into the reality of the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thus the church can be defined in terms of relations with the hierarchy as established through the mysteries of the church, being ordination of the hierarchs and then baptism and chrismation and partaking of the Eucharist for the faithful. The mysteries establish relations, but union is not affected merely by the mysteries. Rather, union requires a union of mind and will with the hierarchy. That is a relationship of obedience or discipleship with the hierarchy as a hierarchy of the church. As well as the public level of these relations with the church through the hierarchy, there is also a realization of these relations at a private level. These are affected in three main ways. Firstly, as children, there is an obedience owed to the parents. For all this to be fully beneficial for the children, both the parents and the children must be baptized members of the church so that the Christ is present to the children through the parents and the children are able to be united to Christ having been born again as the sons of God. The parents are obliged to ensure that they bring up their children in faith, piety and virtue. The next relationship structure is that of marriage in which one stands in the place of Christ as head and the other is in the place of man in obedience. So to be free from any contention of who is better than the other, the order is established through the exterior images of male and female. Thus, the male stands as the image and glory of God and the female as the glory of man. This relationship is one of asymmetry in which the wife unites to Christ through obedience to her husband in all things. And the husband unites to Christ by presenting Christ to his wife. It is a consequence of a fall that the co-rule of women was subjected to their men, so that we as humans know that return to God requires obedience and subjection to God, so that we may co-rule in the coming age. Again, for this relation to be truly benefit union with God, both husband and wife must be members of the church. The mystery of marriage confirms and established this relationship in Christ. The final private level relationship is that of monasticism. In this relationship, the monk goes into a relationship of obedience to an abbot, who in turn presents Christ to the monk. Here we also have a mystery affected through the rites for church in establishing one as a monk. For our salvation, we need to live in the context of these relations, both at a private level and at a public level, because only as such can we subject our self-will to another, so as to be able to be united to the will of God. The worst thing for any human is to be in context of doing simply as one wills free from any obedience or responsibility. There can be exceptions to these structures, as seen in the rare cases with some saints, but this requires a level of purity, discernment, and humility that are very rare, so as to distinguish honestly the will of God from one's own will and to pr purpose of mind, to obey the will of God over one's own thoughts. 
This is establishes the primary outline of understanding the church in terms of theotic relations as founded on Christ and the apostles. So what do theotic relations mean in practice? Key to theotic relations is, to, uh, is that the relations are to unite each one to God in the image and likeness of God, as it is realized in each. Thus, re these relations need to respect the image of God in each in obedience while enabling a union of will. The first thing that we, these relations have is permanence. Relationship with God is an eternal, and so theotic relations are permanent. One is married to the same person for life, one stays in the same monastery, Then bishops and presbyters remain in the same church. We have the principle of stability. Through the permanence, one realizes eternal union with God and the saints. Union with God is realized through the permanence of this relationship, so long as man lives. The theotic relations are in themselves living symbols through which man comes into union with God and not ends in themselves. Thus, their function ends on death, and they are not continued as such in the coming age when the union of God and all the faithful is perfected. This does not mean that we do not continue to be bound to those to whom we have a theotic relation, such as a spouse in marriage, but we will be bound to God and all the saints at a level far transcending the theotic relationship that thus loses its exclusive bond, yet we continue to be bound to the other indescribably more closely than in this life. Because of the permanence of these relationships, it is important to avoid entering partial relations of this nature that are not bound to permanence. In the church, those coming to the church are tested as catechumens for even a number of years to ensure that their union with the church is grounded in permanence and not a fleeting fancy. In private matters, the sexual union is part of the bonding of the flesh as one in a tangible manner. And so it needs to be reserved exclusively for the permanent bond of marriage. Temporary relationships are a denial of the purpose of the relations or a union with God because they reduce human relations to temporal affairs that are opposed in principle to the eternal stability of the triune God. The only proper reason for separation in marriage is a lack of faithfulness. And this is heavier burden on the woman. The adultery of a wife is not only a betrayal of her husband, it is a betrayal of Christ. She is a casting aside Christ in her husband and taking another Christ in the new man. This is a fundamental rupture of the theotic relationship. And so she is to be separated from her husband. This can be seen in the context of Christ in relation to Israel, the Old Testament church. Israel, as though through her leaders, in preferring Caesar to Christ and a murderer to the giver of life in seeking the crucifixion of Christ. Thus, they betrayed Christ and were cut off from the tree of life. And the foreign woman, the church of the Gentiles, was taken as the bride through faith in Christ. Christ, in turn, has one church and will not cast off his church. So a man cannot cast off his wife or take another. The other ground for separation marriage is that of an unbeliever in which the unbeliever is not bound to the relationship and cannot be bound. Although for the sake of the children and a hope of salvation, the believer does not depart from the unbeliever. There are needs of economy where the human weakness of the husband and wife may cause deeper problems that inhibit salvation. And so some separation is permitted, but with a continuing hope possibility of reconciliation. In such cases, even permitting economy of separation in place of living, remarriage is not permitted because it denies the permanence of theotic relationship, which transcends the moral, physical, and mental capacity of the spouse. Remarriage can take place due to the death of one's partner because a theotic relationship comes to an end at that point. Nevertheless, to avoid serial remarriages from denying the permanence of the relationship in principle, these are limited to two remarriages. Remarriage for younger people is even recommended so that they remain within the structure of theotic relationship. 
Although for older people, they may be a point of transcending this for a more direct union with God, having had their self-will tempered by many years of faithful marriage. Likewise, a monk must stay in his monastery because he betrays Christ in departing from the abbot. So to a nun from her abyss, the exception to this is those perfected in obedience to seek to, to more direct relation to God through constant prayer and without human distraction. So becoming a hermit. This though is after being perfected through the theotic relations and not apart from them. The permanence grounds a true discipleship and spiritual growth. It also helps to ground inner stillness and peace. Bishops as forming a part, the center of unity of each church are permanent in their churches and should not transfer from one church to another church. He is Christ among the faithful and is Christ the permanent center of the church. So should the bishop yeah. remain as such for the church in which he is ordained? Even more appropriately, the presbyters too, of all the clergy, should be stable in the churches to which they are ordained. It is even best that the bishop should be ordained from one of the local presbyters or deacons to continue the permanence rather than being brought in from outside the church. Given this principle of permanence, there are times when moving is required. In these cases, unless there is a force beyond the hierarchy's control, the member of the clergy should only move with the consent of the bishop or the metropolitan in the case of the bishop or the consent of the clergyman and with the consent of the clergyman. The bishop should not move the presbyters and clergy around, but they should stay in the temple in which they were ordained to serve. Again, in the context of a parish, the presbyter is Christ to the faithful of that parish, and the relationship should, should again be permanent. Governance. Because the image of God must be respected, while obedience is owed to one in the relationship, this obedience must respect two core principles. One is that it cannot be forced on the other physically or emotionally, unless one denies the very image being saved. The obedience given must be freely given. And two, that the lower one has a jurisdiction of authority that cannot be infringed, such as a metropolitan cannot interfere with the diocese of the bishop of his synod, and a presbyter cannot interfere in the home of his parishioner, other than so far as teaching and ruling regarding the tradition of the church, that is Christ's commandments. A wife should have authority in the home and over the children, and the children over their own space and pets. The principal authority is the singular exercise of will, so that in the jurisdiction of authority, that will cannot be exercised directly by another, although it still needs to be exercised within a framework of the higher. This requires balance and respect. Another principle to maintain is that one cannot have two masters. So in this context, a member of a clergy cannot work for the government as having two masters, nor should a member of a clergy be employed for another by another in such that his time is under two orders, that is, of the hierarchy of a church for the performance of the services and of the employer. This does not mean that a clergy cannot work in the secular activities for income, but only that they must be work as self-employed so that they remain masters of their time and so not in potential conflict with two masters. For this principle also, the order of deaconess was only open to unmarried women over the age of 40. She should not be under the master of her husband and that of the bishop. This would cause a conflict of obedience and undermine the unity of obedience. Jurisdiction. Importantly for theotic relations is a principle of jurisdiction, and this is defined on space. That is, a man leaves his father's house and establishes his own jurisdiction in his own house or space. A presbyter has jurisdiction in his parish, but not beyond. A bishop in his own church, but not beyond. A bishop needs to respect the jurisdiction of a presbyter in his parish, while yet maintaining an oversight authority over all the parishes. Where it comes to matters of decision regarding lower levels, the higher levels need to exercise the authority in synod with consent. That is, in matters regarding the faithful of the church, the bishop needs to decide to give of the presbyters. In matters regarding the churches in the province, the metropolitan must decide in a synod with the bishops. In matters of a house and children, 
the husband wants to decide with his wife. The principal consent is required in order within another's jurisdiction to order within another's jurisdiction, even if that jurisdiction is under within one's own. And because the singular will of the other in their jurisdiction cannot be forced upon them. They must exercise that through their consent. As the large jurisdictions ascend to converge for one of unity, the authority of a higher lessens in respect to the lower. So the, because of a greater authority of the lower. Thus, relations between patriarchs, even given the priority of one, must or are almost entirely at the level of brothers, with the oldest brother having a certain priority among, but not over. Whereas a monastic relationship is one of strict obedience to a monk to the abbot in all things. In the higher cases, decisions are by mutual consent. Again, the principle of asymmetry is of a union in one mind. It's not about forcing oneself on another or enslaving another, because this would be to deny the image of God in the other. The one in obedience should do so as to Christ himself, who is actually present in the other. And to close this set session, I'll talk about the human side of these relations. Because the relations are through human images, the one in authority can order things contrary to Christ. This, in this, one remembers that they are tangible symbols of relationship to God. And obedience to, in them is obedience to God. And the responsibility for others is the responsibility of God. Obedience to the human is not an absolute in itself, but only as a tangible means of obeying God. This realization may seem to be a limit on the relationships, but it is rather beneficial. Obedience is not that of a slave or a servant, but one that takes the other's will as one's own will, to be of one mind and one will. One through submitting and obedience is not being controlled by the other, but as acting as one with the other, as doing the one's own will that is united to the other. Given that one has authority when one is, is, one is also responsible for one's own actions. Thus commands and obedience do become one's own responsibility. They are freely taken. So one needs to have discernment and obedience and not blindly take all things as given, but as consistent with the Lord. One is free to disobey a command contrary to that of Christ because such obedience is not obedience to Christ, but to man in himself. However, one needs care here, not to use this as an excuse of self-will and judgment. That is, we know that God orders things that seem incongruent yet nevertheless are to be obeyed, such as Abraham being ordered to sacrifice Isaac. In these cases, there is not a direct command contrary to the commands of God, but one that with reason may appear to be contrary. In these cases, it is important to obey by putting aside one's limits of one's own reason and to trust God. So if the command is clearly contrary to that of Christ, then one is free to not obey in obedience to Christ. But care is needed that some seemingly strange commands, because it's important to remember that obedience is a in a theotic relation is obedience to Christ. So disobedience to this command can be disobedience to Christ. Overall, the context of obeying through a human provides a context of self-responsibility and obedience and personal ownership of the other's will which is important in union with God as sons of God, rather than as a servant or slave. That's the end of this, this session. Okay, thank you very much, Father Patrick. Then it's now time for Father Alexander to respond to uh, Father Patrick's presentation. You have to uh, unmute yourself, Father Alexander. That's it. Father Patrick, can you oh. hear me? Yes. Yes. I cannot see you because a list of names is blocking the center of my screen and I have not been able to remove it. Oh. However, <laughs> I can hear you and therefore I can respond. 
as you have described, obedience in any of the theotic relationships you've outlined calls for discernment. I don't think that anybody could disagree. However, with some of the details you've provided, problems arise on the practical level, on all of those practical levels. In the diocese, in the monastery, in the parish, and in the family. It would be wonderful if we lived in an unfallen world, if these relationships were not marred by sin and complex, and if they were not so often so easily open to abuse. Uh, you did touch on the issues of when a, an authority commands something that is clearly contrary to Christ or does something that is clearly hateful uh, from a Christian point of view. However, in some of those cases, it seems that you depicted the titular authority and its activity, to my view, slightly simply, as though almost invariably the error falls on one side rather than the other. Let's start with something very everyday and personal. If, as Paul says in Ephesians, the husband is Christ and the wife is the church, and the wife's infidelity or betrayal or rebellion against the husband would therefore symbolize at least the church's rebellion against Christ. What if the husband is the adulterer? What if the husband is the abuser? What if the husband is the tyrant? And could you relate that to the, relate the, the parallel questions? What if the abbot misuses his authority? What if the priest, the bishop, misuses his authority? We count Nestorius among the greatest heresiarchs, and he was Archbishop of Constantinople. Could you address one after the other the question of the husband as adulterer and say the abbot or bishop as adulterer, extending that metaphor. Right, in the case of a husband's adulterer, there does, he is clearly in a state of sin. He's clearly betraying Christ and seeking a second church. So this is a, a, an action contrary to, to Christ. In the sense of theotic relation, there is, and St. Basil speaks about this, a, a seemingly interesting, um, asymmetry in the relationship. Sometimes the wife, nevertheless, if he's committed fornication as such, maintains her relationship to him. And I say that because he sort of still, in a sense, remains Christ. Um, nevertheless, in the practical reality of life, there is every reason that the wife can leave her husband for betraying Christ himself, betraying who Christ is by his fornication apart from the church, seeking a second church. So there is a tradition of the church and it's a, a, an asymmetry here, but one can also see the, the practical consequences of this. Again, the um, has, we're being very strict on the St. Basil and things. If sometimes a husband is an animal and abuses his wife, again, he's completely contrary to Christ. There's no excuse for this. It's a barbaric behavior because he's actually infringing the very image of God and his wife by so treating her as such. Um, nevertheless, there is a case where the wife carries this as a martyrdom and through that. So there is a state that the, the relationship transcends the, 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 the sin of either party, just as if the wife is completely disobedient, spends all of the husband's money without his consent, etc. He nevertheless lives with her. He nevertheless stays with her and keeps her and protects her and does everything for her, just as God looks after us for our constant sin. So, but... Again, all this is exercise economy of the church. So if people, this is too heavy a burden, if this is going to crush somebody, this is going to wreck somebody's, then there is space for separation. There's a space for other things within these relationships. But this should be exercised in the context of the theotic relationship, of the, the sense of permanence, the sense of a place of Christ, rather than just at a human level. So we, we must... Uh, deal with these matters, accepting the reality of the human situation, but and also in the context of theological position. Now, the next one was the bishop's uh, or abbot's abuse. I think, again, the same for, the, for an abbot. If an abbot abuses a thing, and 
in this case as well, the um, the monks, if if it becomes the tradition is if abbots starts teaching heresy, um, so formally teaching heresy, the monks are to leave because he has betrayed his position as abbot. And this is true for any bishop or and um, patriarch as of the canons are quite clear that if he teaches at a predefined heresy, so in other words, the monk or the clergy are not defining what is or not heresy. It has already been determined as heresy and the bishop reaches this. The, the presbyters, et cetera, are no longer bound to follow that. Nevertheless, if the bishop is a sinner and uh, an abusive person, there remains a sort of a, a sense of him obedience to him unless the synod of bishops defrocks him, which they should do. So you can appeal to the synod and say, my bishop is acting poorly, but, but the presbyter shouldn't make the judgment himself and determine that the bishop has ceased to function as a bishop in, in that particular case. It should be determined by the, by the council of the synod of the bishops. Um, again, the right jurisdictions are doing the right levels of, of judgment. Um, yeah, and again, the same sort of for the um, abbots in the relationship to the monk. So there, sadly, these cases can be done. And wherever orders are, as I said, contrary to Christ, one can step away from them because otherwise one will fall with the abbot or one will fall with the hierarchy. You, you, you go with them. Were the priests under Nestorius obliged to obey him before he was condemned by a council? The priests would have, I believe, I will talk on this a little bit more in the next section, but the, um, there is obedience and obedience. So in other words, a presbyter isn't actually in direct obedience to the bishop as a servant. So in other words, the bishop, if he starts ordering him around to sweep the floor or something, the, the presbyter has no duty to obey the bishop in that way. But where the, there is a sense that they still actually had to work with the bishop was just in this plain consent of serving the liturgy, etc. So unless he actually denied them of oh, no just reason from serving, they nevertheless had to respect him as a center of union of the churches and conduct his services with his consent and do all things in proper order. So far as he continued to function as a, as a bishop, to, to continue the unity so they don't split themselves into schism or pass judgment before the council has passed judgment. Did you say pass judgment before the council has passed judgment? Yes, so in other words, if the, the well, still pending the judgment of the council is not the place of the presbyter to deny the, the functional role of the bishop in uniting the services, even though they may step well away from him in what he's teaching or what he commands if, it, if it's causing him to do some an opposition to the, the teachings and, and, and tradition of the church. But nevertheless, they should respect his position until he is formally defrocked from it. Would you extend that to the wife of an abusive husband before he is charged? This it is a matter um, that in some of the saints, yes, the wife respects her husband even in that context. But this is a tricky situation in the modern context because this takes a certain sense of faith, a certain sense of moral perspective, a certain sense of um, trust in, in Christ's will. And most women in modern times would not be able to cope without a, a, a serious mental breakdown or a, a, a damage to their soul and, and psyche. So I would not recommend that. But in principle, the, the, the fathers do talk about she should try to endure that as a cross. Um, but this, this is one thing that requires a great economy from case to case basis. You speak of stability as the ideal on all of these levels and in all of these relationships. I can't imagine anyone who would not see stability in a functional relationship as the ideal. What about stability in a dysfunctional relationship? In other words, where the salvation of a person, not just their emotional well-being or their perceived ego or power levels, but the actual uh, Christian identity of a person is in danger in a dysfunctional, would-be theotic relationship? Um, again, seeing this as a matter of salvation, the church always exercises 
its laws, its rules with economy, and especially in regard to a person's salvation. And if the strict following of the rule was going to inhibit the person's salvation, then it is to be set aside for an economy. So this type of relationship where it is abusive to the extent that it's going to damage someone's eternal salvation in and should be put aside. It is no longer truly a theotic relationship, but it's something that is leading away from Christ. And for the salvation of the person, it can be set aside. But again, with these setting aside, this needs to be done on a very careful basis on a need by needs, a true economy of need and not an excuse to say, oh, well, I'm fed up with this person and, and an overclaiming of a situation. So this takes, again, much discernment by the, the, the clergy, the hierarchy, et cetera, to, to truly see what the situation is. But certainly there is a scope in the economy of the church for the salvation of the people, that these relationships between symbols of union with God are set aside if they are failing to do their to work for their purpose. Of course, on a larger level, this arises in the question of the old and new Israels. You alluded to uh, the understanding of the new Israel, I should say the Israel of God, fully revealed, supplanting the claims of the old Israel. Would that not be parallel to these particular close personal relations in which, in other words, let us let's let's put it this way: Jews would not see Christians as having supplanted Judaism, but having been the husband who divorces the wife, who breaks the covenant. How would you relate this to these relations, the relationships of monks to abbots, uh, laity to priests or bishops? Depending on how you view it, the deliverance from an intolerable situation might be seen as betrayal. Right, yes. Um, again, the, as I said, the theotic relationships are not ends in themselves. So where the relationship has broken down due to the lack of faith, of false teaching, um, a certain level of abuse, then the abuser, the false teacher, has actually the one that has betrayed Christ. Now, properly, these things should be done, not simply by the self-will of the one in the relationship, though, of course, at times one needs to remove themselves from the relationship in a rather a hurry um, before waiting for counsel, but should be then set up for determination by the synod of a local church in the case of a um, of the presbyters and the bishop in the case of a marriage situation or in the case of bishops or higher clergy with a, with a synod. So that the, the case can be properly measured out so that, is, so that the, the unfaithfulness is clearly manifest, that it is, it is known and recorded and determined by the, by the hierarchy of the church. So this is prevented sort of being an exclusive way of moving back and forward. Um, and this takes quite a lot of honesty from the hierarchy that they are willing to um, condemn one of their members or their brothers as such. Um, and we see this as a great problem in, in, in what happened in, the, in Roman Catholic terms of abuse of priests not being protected rather than being properly judged, um, which has actually been a detrimental to the church overall. So in this case, there is an obligation on the hierarchy to hear it but we do need to use the hierarchical structure to hear it, to make sure that everything is, and any combination is properly done. So that a monk is not using it as an excuse to run away from obedience, but that the, a monk has truly had to leave the, the abbot for, because he was an abuser. And ultimately the abbot is removed and replaced by a new abbot in the monastery. Um, and so, yes. So we, should, we need to balance between the, the, the discretion of the others to make sure that the case is truly that of an abuse, um, but allowing the circumstances of a, a need and immediacy to also um, give scope. And, and again, there's many gray areas in this. There's not necessarily exact answer for each person. It depends a lot on the inner being of each person and, and the particular needs of their salvation. So. A case in point, a case study, COVID-19 pandemic. One bishop, but not other bishops, 
closes the churches in his archdiocese. The government does not oblige this. A synod of bishops does not oblige this. One bishop in particular makes a judgment call. Priests in his archdiocese, one or more, continue to serve the divine liturgy on the basis that Christ has commanded, take, eat, this is my body. Do they obey the bishop or not? Right. This is one of these cases where we have to balance between the bishop of um, the bishop. Well, serving with the consent of the bishop is, 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 is correctly framing it and our general obedience to Christ. Now, serving with the consent of the bishop is there for a purpose to stop a presbyter forming his own little conclave, his own little church on his own right, as if he could be the church in himself. The presbyters must be in the theotic union with the, the, the bishop. It does not, however, this right of consent does not give the bishop right to deny the priesthood of the presbyter and does not give him a right to make a general order to the whole priesthood to stop being priests, to stop doing what they are bound to do as priests. This is a command and authority over the, the presbyters rather than a central union uniting them together. And as such, he's actually overstepping his boundary. To make such a decision affecting all parishes as one should be done with the consent of all the presbyters. This should be done in council. There's not the bishop's singular will to order such a thing around. So in this case, the presbyters have every right to continue their duty as presbyters and serving the liturgy, because that is not something that can be stopped. It has a continual thing. We must continually be united to God. We must continually partake of the, the sacraments. It's not something that can be switched on and off in time. It is a permanent institution. Our relationship to God is permanent. And so in theory, this cannot be stopped. But on a particular case-by-case -case basis, the bishop may have a need to do so, but on a singular case-by-case -case basis. Yet, on occasion, if a presbyter decides to follow the bishop's order on that point, I sometimes don't condemn him because he could be, uh, feel the need for a thing. So I'm not passing judgment on anybody, but just simply saying it is, it is better, I think, to, to pursue the will of God in this and serving. But if someone did stop for a on the order of a bishop, then is not to be condemned either. Thank you. Yes, uh, bishop. Yes. Father Alexander, I think we should give Thank you, you. Yeah, an yes, opportunity. We will continue after the break so you can ask a more questions. So before the break, we should give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. So I think we are, we are not a very large group, so you can just um, raise your hand. You don't need to use the chat box. And then you know, ask your question. And Father Patrick, you can of course also address your question to Father Alexander if you like. That's not a problem. Is this a break? No, <laughs> not yet. Well, I have a question. Oh, I think. Um, all right, Jeremy, and then uh, Christina. Okay, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Christina. So you were very um, clear cut about a number of things. And you mentioned the hypostatic nature of the person. And while it's very clear what the three persons of the Trinity are, I have found that when you start trying to trace down the hypostatic nature, three persons in the human person, it gets very blurred. The writers all seem to think they know who those three persons are. But when you start trying to pin it down, it's never quite clear to me if they're the same in all places. So I wondered how you define the uh, three persons in the human person. Oh, um, I don't define the, um, as such, I don't really address the question of a one single human epistasis as being the whole triad in itself or an image of the triad in itself. Rather, the human epistasis is the image of God, um, God as na his na God's nature, God's uh, nature and energies as an image of that. As in this, and in particular, as being a son of the son, an image with the image. So humanity finds its proper place in the son. It, it is, if you are to understand the, the human context with the triad, the human, humanity 
is a sun in the sun, a sun with the sun. And so we understand our human place regarding the triad as a sun with the sun. And thus, our relationship to the Father is understood in context of the manner of existence of a son. And so we relate to the son like the son, and we receive the Holy Spirit as the son does eternally. So we fit into the triad. We receive the Holy Spirit as the son receives the Holy Spirit. We honor the Father as the son honors. So the human image is not a, is a sensory reflection of the of who who God is as the son is a complete and utter perfect image of the father, everything that God is. And in a sense, it's human is a sort of little microcosm of that. But in far as the terms of the relationship with the um, epistases, they are sons with the son and in whom the spirit abides and to the honor of the father. Thank you. I think, uh, Christina, you had a question as well. Thank you. Um, I may have misunderstood. Um, you state that the, there was this um, situation where the, the bishop closes the church and then the priests did not necessarily agree with that decision. And you went on to say that in, in a sense priests could, could continue because they're pledged, that's their duty to, to perform the liturgy. It, it, is that right? And if so, if so, could, could it not be that the priests could continue to perform the liturgy, but not in an open church? Why would the congregation need to be there if they had someone to, to read? Oh, from? right. Yes. So the, the question is rather that the whether the priest could just serve in a a closed church with just a single person being present in him as, as distinct from having the congregation present there as well. In principle, the church is Christ and the faithful gathered together as one. The, the gathering of a church for the Eucharist at, or actually at any time we'll be gathered together at matins, etc., is defined as the faithful gathering around the, the presbyter. So unless the presbyter wants to excommunicate the church, the church is not actually properly defined with only the presbyter and a reader there at the deliberate exclusion of the laity. The laity have to be there. Now, in a quorum for a service, the presbyter and a single reader can conduct a complete liturgy as a quorum, but that is never to the exclusion of any laity who wish to attend. That's only because the laity are too lazy or whatever, or, or, or stuck or uh, unable to attend for some reason, but never to close the doors on the faithful unless they happen to get too late for the liturgy or something like that in the ancient tradition. But there's never a sense of excluding the laity because in such doing, you're actually denying the church as church and the offering itself fails to be an offering of the church. It, 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 it's, it's actually a false offering because it is denying the church by pushing the faithful out the door. So there is no sense to me of where you can, you can have a minimum quorum, but to deliberate exclude is, is not permitted in the, in the way of the church. We, even in a pandemic? Even in a pandemic. No, in principle, it cannot, the faithful cannot be excluded from attending the church. You can put all sorts of, um, spread yourselves out, please, and maybe even put a mask on or something like that. Um, but you cannot close anyone who's a member of the church from, from coming in. That would be a denial of the church and a denial of their place in the church. And the church is defined by the gathering coming together. This is how we are known as a church, the gathering in one place together. So, yeah, it, it's, it's a fundamental issue of ecclesiology um, that this is the door is open for the faithful. At, well, at least before the liturgy starts. <laughs> there is an ancient trust and shutting about once it's begun. Um, um, Mongol has a question. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how this works, so I'll try. My question relates to the to the communion uh, in the early church said basil refers to during the times of persecution and other reasons christians taking communion home and having the communion at home 
all through the week or whatever. He, there is a passage I can quote from one of his letters. Mm. Now, why has the church, as far as I know, nobody seems to have ever, I don't know, maybe you know, this has not been discussed with the Zoom services at the beginning of the COVID crisis. This could have been a, a very serious way of dealing with the fact that most of the people at home feel almost excommunicated, as Marcus Plestert put it in another lecture. Why has this been discussed at all? If, if so, I don't know about it. Or has it, is it all the hierarchy too frightened to actually talk about it? Um, well, as a solution, I haven't actually heard the, this as being offered as a solution to the, um, to the issue. I think that that particular customer is so lost now in practice of the way both that we are, in a sense, not communing every day as such, people are coming to church once a month as it is, or uh, once a week at, at best. So the, the principle that constant communion has in a sense been lost. And also the piety around the holy body and the, and the blood of Christ, the, the no, no, laity no longer receive it on the hand, in a sense to prevent it being dropped, spilt, or something unworthy un un being helped to it. So there's, a, I think, a general reluctance of Mount clergy today from centuries of this sort of practice to, to allow people to take it home. And that also assumes that the people are coming to church at least once a week for the liturgy to take something home for the rest of the week. So I think generally because we are no longer communion every uh, day, that um, this, this has not really not crossed anyone's mind. And sadly, I think some people are sort of even forgetting due to, again, uh, the, almost a non-attendance <laughs> even regular week that we need to be at least worshiping once a week at, at, at a minimum and, and communion each time we, we do so. So the, sadly, various things have compounded this, but this particular issue has not been offered as a solution as far as well, I know. Well, I'm rather disappointed that at a time when we are in a parallel situation of say a plague or something, you know, it is a plague and, um, the hierarchs are not actually thinking about this. And if they are worried about it being taken wrongly or something, really, shouldn't they leave it to God? I mean, it's not a question of them standing on prejudging people as to whether, suppose most people who join the Zoom services are there because they want to, in some sense, participate in, 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 the, in that. And the only con thing that's stopping it being holistic is this actual the taking of the communion. And I'm really astonished there's been no fresh thinking on this at all when there is precedence, you know. I just wanted to make sure I'm right or wrong in thinking there's been no fresh thinking on this. I, I've, I've not heard anything in particular. No. On, on, as, for the, as for your comment about the church being left open, I can tell you my daughter lives in Egina, the Greek island, and that's what they've been doing all along the COVID. The priest is with the reader doing, they leave all the doors open, people stand in the courtyard and then they go in and take communion. And the government knows nothing about it. And um, mind you, they're on an island and there's no police watching them, so quite strictly. So they've been carrying on uh, in this fashion uh, right through the, through the crisis. And May I? Okay, okay I, so have... I think we need to have a break now, Father Alexander, you, you can uh, make your comment just at the beginning of the next session. I think it's time for a short break. So uh, we'll continue in 10 minutes time. So like uh, 7.50, yeah? 10 to 8. So we have a, a brief uh, break and then we continue and Father Alexander can uh, make his comments at the beginning, I think. Okay, sure. thank you. See you soon. So welcome back to the second part of our conversation. Um, as I said before the break, I think uh, I'd like to give the word first to Father Alexander because I cut him short uh, before the break. Uh, he wanted to ask some question or uh, make some comments. So please, Father Alexander. Thank you. I just had some information from Angela in answer to her question. Uh, one of the priests of our archdiocese read the passage from St. Basil the Great about providing the people with 
portions of the priest's sanctified gifts to commune themselves in the course of the week. He asked our bishops for blessing. The bishop didn't exactly give the blessing or deny it. Uh, the priest went ahead and provided uh, those portions of the precious gifts pre-sanctified for the people during the week. He went on to Facebook to try to begin a discussion about this practice and whether he others thought this was viable. He was immediately shot down by a reader of another archdiocese who took it upon himself to accuse this bit priest of all sorts of things. I myself wasn't entirely comfortable with the practice, but the, the, the discussion came to an end because of people's reactions to it, or at least one person's reaction to it. So there was in fact some effort to start a discussion about whether this was a viable practice for members of the Orthodox Church. Oh, thank you for that. I think I heard vaguely about it, but I didn't know about the shutdown business, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was, you know, simply thinking that there could be safeguards and, you know, we don't stop people taking holy water home, you know, then we trust they won't use it, abuse it. And I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but since there is precedence, couldn't people have worked out something, you know, as they worked out the Zoom service? Anyway, it's a disappointment, that's all, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Father Patrick, now I think it's time for the second part of your presentation. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to go and talk about symbols next, because this is important. The use of symbols is central to theotic relations. They're important because the relations manifest the unseen and unseeable God. Being manifest through humanity means that humans themselves become the symbols. In a tangible sense, the symbols are realized through the senses of primary letter vision, but also including sound. Due to the incarnation, these symbols are not merely abstractions, but consist of real and particular forms. The unchanging character of Christ also provides a level of consistency and continuity of these symbols through time and space. We find the same symbols in all places and through all times. Thus, the symbols have specific forms that to a degree fixed in the tradition of the church and common to all places and times. The relationship to God is man is one of two, God and man. And it applies across all humanity. So in terms of a visible and sound form, there's a natural dual human symbol available in all societies and at all times, that of male and female. One of these can stand in the position of God as head and the other in obedience as man in their mutual relation. Apostolic tradition has passed down that the male is the symbol of God, the glory of God, and the female of man, the glory of man. This is reflected at two levels. The first in private relations of marriage, where the man is as Christ, God, and a woman as the church, man. This leads to an asymmetric relationship of love and sacrifice of the man for the woman, to bring her into perfect union with God, and a woman in obedience to allow her to be brought into perfect union with God. The man unites to God by as perfecting the likeness of God towards the woman. The symbolic nature of a relationship and one in which the symbol is particular and fixed means that the marriage can only be between a male and a female. It was only through the asymmetry made tangible through these forms is a theotic potential of relationship able to be realized. Only in this way is a relationship a mystery and effective for the union of God and man, thus salvation from death. The second is in this public sphere, where because there is one teacher, one Lord, one priest, Christ as God-man, the male form is used to present this in public, whereas the female form continues to present man as man. This symbolic language is used in reference to God himself as father and son. Again, this distinction is not about the quality of man and woman as human beings, or whether one is better than the other as a human, but as a matter of form, so as to 
the required symbol is tangibly present in the distinction of God and man in human relations. Another key form of symbol is used to distinguish a point but or ordained clergy from the laity. This is realized through the clothing or vestments. The clergy, especially when acting liturgically, vest in specific forms of clothing that identify their clerical orders. These forms of clothing have become relatively fixed in tradition, according to the principles above, so that they are common across time and place. And thus, one immediately can recognize the specific orders of the priesthood as sharing a common tradition. Note, clothing is also used to mark the distinction of men and women, each of whom should wear clothing unique to their specific sex, as reinforcing the, that naturally ordered by God, showing human participation in the will of God through exercising each one's own will to conform to the will and order of God. Because the clergy is not only clergy during services, but are also so in all contexts, they wear specific vestments in non-liturgical times also. Along with the vestments, there is also the cut of hair and the covering of it. The general symbol is for man to keep their hair short as proper for authority, and for women as having long hair as proper to their obedience. To this is added the synergy of removing head coverings for men during prayer and for women adding a covering to her hair during prayer, or even more generally as being in obedience at all times to in all things to Christ. The clergy cut their hair in a special manner, a tonsure, as distinguishing from the laity. Men in general do not remove their beards as part of their male symbol. Monastics, unlike laymen, will wear hoods or head coverings to show that they are under obedience, although as males, but will remove it at specific times in honor of their natural symbol as the glory of God. Nuns, on the other hand, are covered always. Another symbol is in the place of worship that helps to distinguish the roles of theotic relations is a sin thrown in, in the church. That is a seating of the, behind the altar, the semicircle, where you have a one throat elevated above the others as a bench or beside them. Here we have the symbol par excellence of the bishop enthroned as Christ, along with the elders presbyters, just in the vision of revelation. Thus we see Christ present in the hierarchs and the rulers and judges of the church. It is also establishes a hierarchy in the place of God in relation to humanity, the laity and the maid. Preaching ex cathedra also reinforced the symbol, and the placing of altar before the sin thrown on establishes the offering as that of Christ on the heavenly altar because it stands before the throne of God. Also in the nave, the male and female stand apart as proper to ordering them to their theotic relationship roles, as well as indicating the temporary ca character of these relations and that in the coming age, they are set aside with a direct relation to God, symbolized by each one standing directly in context to the hierarchy of the church rather than with each other. They are also apart from their own jurisdiction of home and so conform to the public order of God in obedience to the hierarchy rather than doing as they will. This is also why in the ancient times, the subdeacons and deacons arranged where the faithful stood or sat in the nave, and it was not simply a matter of personal choice or lay ushers. They, this also incidentally leads to the reason why clergy from subdeacons onwards cannot marry after ordination. This is because they have a public theotic relation with the congregation according to their order, and have been established in that relation through ordination. Once having been established in that order through ordination, they cannot enter in a different form of relationship with a member of the faithful at a private level. The high level takes precedence over the lower, so that one can be married and then take the place wider role because they are 
only in a theoretic relationship with one, and so not yet in a permanent relation to all. But once again, they have a permanent relation to all and cannot change that relationship to a private one without ceasing to be a member of the clergy. The permanence of relations means that they cannot return to the public or clerical order if they are disposed from that order. The private life of clergy must match that of the public role. That is one Christ in relation to one church. So in symbols, one male in relation to one female in private matters, especially at the level of physical union that is in marriage, as one woman and also in a sexual level not having relations prior to marriage. His wife, too, should have one Christ in like manner. The notion of theotic relations provides an explanatory principle for what we have regarding the relations of husband and wife and for public roles of men and women, as well as those, the use of clothing. Eucharistic ecclesiology cannot provide such an explanation being limited to the Eucharist. We find rather that in all these symbols, there are a full expression and place in the Eucharist gathering about the hierarchy as pointing to the end, union with God through and in Christ. However, they continue beyond the Eucharist through, though, because they are grounded in human relations themselves as continuing to present Christ through symbols at all times and places through these relations. Participation in the symbols is not merely an option that one and live the spiritual principle apart from these symbols. Rather as being a beings of body and soul, we also need to partake of the tangible form of a symbol to participate in Christ. One can transcend a symbol, but only after being perfected in the symbol and are not apart from it. The concept of theotic relations also speaks to the boundary of the church. What is called church, according to Ignatius of Antioch, is a gathering about the bishop, presbyters, and deacons, and nothing else can be called church. Thus, we have here that the definite position of the church is that it's gathering around the hierarchy of the church, that is, in the context of theotic relations. It is through these relations with the hierarchy that in being baptized by them and receiving communion from them and praying with them, that one is a member of the church. The various local churches are recognized and cohere around their chief sees, the metropolitans, and they in turn about the patriarchs, and they about the Sea of Peter, that is Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, so that the boundaries of a church are defined by the communion of the hierarchs. Once this communion is severed, as distinct from being torn, then the severed party is no longer in the church because the body is one framed and on the, the structure of the hierarchs. The severance may result from a separation due to doctrine different, or heresy or through to hierarchical schism and refusing to recognize the proper jurisdiction of another, of another or forming one's own jurisdiction apart from and without the consent of the other hierarchs. Apart from theotic relations, as coined here, these cannot be union with Christ and theotic relations themselves need to be formed in the global web and recognition of these relations as all uniting to one Christ as in one body. Hierarchical links unite those under them. If the hierarchical link is broken, then those under them are broken off with them so long as they remain under them. Thus, when the patriarchate of old Rome went into schism, the entire patriarchate went with him, apart from a few on the edge, such as in Greece, that remained in union with new Rome, Constantinople. The union of theotic relations was broken through the schism, and those in the schism divided from the body according to a framework as established through the unifying character of these theotic relations. There is a lineage to the apostles also through the fathers as Christ to Adam or Abraham through the lineage established in the scriptures. This lineage does not require every bishop to be perfect or free from heresy. But if a lineage is broken, should heresy persist through a number of generations of bishops, or alternative hierarchical stru structures are formed. And this would break the unity of the, the continuance 
and that hierarchical group would drift or be cut off branch of the church. Just as to talk about the post-schism papacy. The modern papacy comes, claims to have immediate episcopal jurisdiction in all churches. This is a claim that is able to ordain by his own will or consent a cleric in any other city or province apart from his own diocesan see. This is to deny in theotic relationships that the bishop being the center of unity of Christ in the local church, and thus both the bishop and the church gathered around him. To illustrate this point, if the Pope of Rome was to present, be present in Lyon and a presbyter asked for consent to serve the liturgy, and the bishop refused and the Pope consented, then in modern day papal theory, the Pope's consent would take priority. Yet this denies a bishop exercising his consent. Otherwise, it introduces another center of consent and union into the church. There can only be one and in one will. This both causes a form of division and also denial of a singularity for which the bishop stands in the local church as his place as a bishop. As such, the post and papal claim is contrary to the principle of ecclesiology according to theotic relations, because it denies the proper authority to the local bishop in his jurisdiction, which is the exercise of a singular will of consent in the church. Sadly, there can be no union with such a claim because it effectively denies the local church in each place. The need for jurisdiction is properly expressed according to place, that is by territory. Each jurisdiction is defined by territory as proper to the church in each place, for all people in that place. There cannot be any jurisdiction by ethnicity, language or culture or wealth or age or anything that distinguishes humans from humans other than the place in which one finds oneself. This is true for the level of a city in each city and for the synods of bishops in each province or nation. I ask as Mark by territory. It is also true for the private relations and an abbot is only abbot of his monastery and a man moves out of his father's house, home or place to establish his own jurisdiction in his own place. In each place, all gather together around one head Christ who is present in each place through the hierarchical order of theotic relations, yet remains in each one in each place is defined by the limits of territory. In this, there is no division of humanity according to any human traits, and all may be united as one about Christ. Territorial jurisdictions helps to delineate the scope of theotic relations so that they are tangible and open to participation in each, for each in each place at a public and private level. Given the respect that the authority of each level cannot be infringed, there's a real authority in each place to do things as willed. In this regard, tradition is not a detailed prescription of every aspect of the church life and practice, but rather a framework of what it is to be church, that is the body of Christ. God does not seek to control us in every detail of our lives but rather seeks to help us to fill our own wills, so long as these conform to his general will. He, will for us, he wills for us to have a real freedom in exercising our own desires and taking responsibility for this. This needs to be respected at all levels, along with respect of obedience and unity of will. This is to manifest regionally in the localization of tradition in each place. Thus, each nation can manage the church in its territory according to its particular desires, so long as these remain within the common tradition. We can and should see regional variations in practice and some rules of practice that are particular to that place. This is manifest through liturgical usage of a cut of vestment, cultural, uh, clerical attire, as well as styles of icons. The respect of obedience to higher authorities helps to maintain a level of con commonality to these matters. So we can see the common liturgical rites and overall form as being consistent across patriarchates. And when these patriarchates 
within these patriarchs, when these patriarchs <coughs> were um, variations, of a, we see variation general pattern according to region and more minor variations according to city and in even each parish. In principle, while the form of a particular liturgical rite in a parish in Russia may be pro proper usage there, it may not be proper usage in a parish in Greece because that parish in Greece needs to work within the parameters of its own local church and regional synod. Importantly, in terms of mission, while one cannot have tradition naked as it were, as its incarnation in local customs, once a new, re new region comes to have its own hierarchy and ownership of its customs, it should be free to alter the received customs in its own ways. The mission is to bring the common tradition and not to impose regional usage upon a, the region beyond the region's boundaries, because this would be denial of a local authority and respect of the image of God among the faithful in the new region. Authority also moves through time. So we should maintain the customs and rules that were received from our forefathers. Thus the church takes on a rather conservative form in respect to this disobedience. It is contrary to principles of authority and jurisdiction to overturn these received customs or to impose foreign customs. However, due to the constantly changing nature of the present world, there is a need to adapt and to modify these customs to meet present conditions. This though should always be in respect to the continuance of obedience. So what is received and not and not as an excuse to change the customs in themselves without need. The modification of customs due to changing needs, though that in the, does, need, um, does not apply to the common tradition. These must remain unchanged in all places and times as defining the presence of Christ on earth in the church. To change this is to deny the church as church. This rules through these rules, though, may be expressed in various regional economy depending on the need of circumstances, but not so as to change or overturn the rules, which continue to apply once the need of economy goes. Local customs being the result of local authority and dependent on local and temporal needs do not carry the level of permanence, even though there is respect for authority means a general continuance of them and only a slow evolution of them. There, where there can be a more dramatic change from the past in terms of customs is where these customs have transgressed the boundaries of tradition, in which case the custom needs to be reformed into line with the tradition. To prevent the churches dividing into regional and national groupings and to limit the power of secular authorities from forming the regional church according to their own will, there's establishment of the patriarchates. And in particular, the patron see of Rome, Old and New, Alexandria, and Antioch. The role of these sees is to provide a universal testimony to the common tradition and maintaining this across all the churches. They are to transcend national and regional variation, although not abstracted from such, to bind the churches beyond the variations of local custom and practice. Thus, we see the general forms of liturgical rites following the patriarchal standards so that they may remain in unity, even with the ver regional variations. The judgment system of church to resolve disputes also allows appeals to be seized to, to, as the judge, not on the regional considerations, but on the consideration of the common tradition, thus keeping in check the tendency of regional churches to prioritize custom over tradition. In the early church, there was a trans provincial exarchs, as well as the patriarchs, and an appeal to the patriarch, particularly that of Rome, old or new, could be made instead of the exarch, but not over the exarch. This reinforces that the appeal was not in terms of imposition of one local custom upon another, but the judgment according to the tradition of the church, as maintained through the universally recognized canons of the church. If a patriarch fell into reducing itself to to, priority, to prioritize his own regional customs, then it can be ignored in the appeal process is imposing custom over tradition and so infringing the proper authority of the local regions. Equality and participation. 
Another important aspect of the theotic relations is the recognition of fundamental equality and dignity of all humans created in the image of God. There is also the recognition with the concept of authority being central to theotic relations, that all the faithful will reign with God eternally, regardless of nationality, sex, age, height, width, or any other human characteristic, apart from those in the likeness of God, the virtues. Humans are not the servants or slaves of God, but co-rulers with him, which is why on Sundays and, other, and after Pascha, until Pentecost, the faithful offer prayers standing as co-rulers with God, raised from death and sin by the grace of God, and no longer slaves of sin and death, in need of prostrating before God, even though due to our continuing struggle with sin, we prostrate at other times. This is also why the presbyters sit on the throne with Christ. The bishop is not enthroned alone, but with the presbyters, and why the apostles did not ordain only bishops for each city, but presbyters, so that there is a synod of co-rule of Christ and the apostles in each place, revealing our eternal reigning with God. Given this equality, we have reinforced the exercise of rule and participation of, of it in all, at all levels. Thus, while a layman does not have authority to rule in the church and public sphere, he nevertheless has proper rule of his own household. The presbyters, while not acting without the consent of the Bishop for Unity, nevertheless have their own proper rule in the parishes to which they are assigned. And with the Bishop touching on wider church matters, such as ordaining clergy. While the abbot in charge of a monastery, he makes all major decisions of the monastery in council with the elders of the monastery. Along with the synodal nature of leadership, the laity also play a role in participation and lending their consent or witness to ordination and classically the amen of the offering of a Eucharist, as affirming their union with and participation of the offering offered through the priests. The role of deaconess is another example of this, in that women, while generally excluded from the public priesthood of the church, nevertheless can participate in specific and real clerical role regarding women, as a sign that women are not excluded from the general priesthood of the faithful. This also applies to restrictions in public speaking and teaching as proper to the priesthood, only as pointing to Christ as the only teacher. But men, participate in this with Christ. Women too participate at a private sphere and teach and govern their own children and elder women teach the younger as a rule and as a abbess rules in her convent. Secular obedience. To close this, I'm just going to talk about a little bit about the principle of obedience in the public form also extends to institutions and approved by God to lead human societies. That is the various levels of government and their laws. We owe obedience to in this regard also, though in discretion is often the state commands in opposition to Christ. One important aspect of this obedience is that to the emperor and the symbol of universal human rule. The authority of the patriarchs is limited to not having one over all the others as in order to order them into council, to prevent one patriarch taking all the churches into heresy through the need of union with that one see, and its authority to command all into council, and thus express the common tradition binding all the faithful, which if an error would mean that all the faithful were bound to error. This means that there is no internal church authority that can call a council to express the common testimony of churches of all nations as to the common tradition. However, obedience to a secular authority meant that the emperor of Rome, as symbolic ruler of the nations, could order the bishops into council from all the world to give common testimony. He does that purely in his secular role as emperor and as not as a member of, and even, does not need to be a member of the church, as was Constantine when he called the first ecumenical council. The bishops can give their testimony to the common tradition during these councils. 
without being bound to their own hierarchical structure. If those presents are in error, then it only falls on them because the unity of the church is maintained apart from the council. Yet if in truth, it establishes a common position of all the churches and their agreement in faith. These councils are helpful to the church, but not in themselves necessary for the church because the tradition was given once for all and nothing needs to be added or can be removed or changed in it. The ecumenical councils only testify to this tradition and clarify it from error. It is the authority owed to the emperor as emperor, who is not a hierarch of the church, that gives the authority for it to be universal in jurisdiction. Although even then, all the various provinces had to confirm it to themselves. So nothing is imposed without respect to proper jurisdictions and the true free unity of will. So in this case, we can see that theotic relations have a general help in establishing the principles of church relate hierarchical relationships between each other, showing proper respect to each level, and yet also remaining, remembering that we have the principle of unity and to come in together as one. And this is what I, I believe that makes the idea of much stronger than the Eucharistic principle for ecclesiology, because it extends right from the private level of husband and wife and the children to parents, right through to the very patriarchal levels of a church and gives a common state of means of unity through these structures that brings us into union with God or theosis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Patrick. Now it's um, Father Alexander's turn to ask you some uh, critical questions. In an age when people aren't even, don't even have a consensus about what the most local hierarchical relationship in the family is, there's even less consensus about the specific ecclesiastical forms. Could you define local church? Is the local church the bishop in the diocese? Is it the Eucharistic community in the parish? Or is it, as sometimes used, a cultural province of the church? Right. As in theotic relations, following St. Ignatius of Antioch, the church proper is defined as those gathered around the bishop, presbyters, and deacons in each place. So that is the church, that is the Catholic church. The whole of the church is formed around this relationship. The, it, the, the relationship, as I said, was maintained through the mysteries. So that you are in union with the church through being baptized by the hierarchy of the church and chrismated by them and partaking of communion from them. That is not just simply that the bishop says you are in communion and you are not. That he must exercise his role through the mysteries of the church. Yet a parish in itself is not the full expression. While in the liturgy, the fullness of a church is present because the hierarchical structure is not fully present. The hierarchical structure needs to be finalized in the bishop. It is not in itself can be said to be the fullness of the Catholic church. That requires the presbyters gathered around the bishop, which is the apostles gathered around Christ. That forms the foundation of what it is to be the church. And this is established in the mystery of the bishop and the presbyters gathered around him. They're all equally priests, all equally governors and teachers, but they unite around the bishop. A presbyter on his own is, in a sense, divide. It, it, it cannot sustain this. He's not the entire synod. He does not represent the fullness of that synod. So we cannot have a parish in itself. Now, in the, the higher level, we can sometimes talk about a local church, but as, as referring to the synod, but properly, this is not the church. The church proper has to be the bishop and the presbyters and the deacons, as St. Ignatius of Antioch says. And this is a major problem with the Roman Catholic idea that somehow the church is one gathered around the papacy. If that was the case, you would have universal deacons and universal presbyters to go with the, the bishop because that is the definition of a structure around which we define the church. Rather, we have the synods of uniting the churches 
is gathering the churches together. So we talk about the churches in Achaia, the churches in Galatia, so we should talk about them in plural. Though, and we can, in a sense, do the common unity of the churches, the common oneness of them, speak about um, the church in Greece or the church in Russia or the church in Serbia as the, the, the unity of that, the synod. However, there is a danger in this in that we have a centralized sense of the patriarchal controlling the inner goings on of all the local dioceses. And sadly, in modern times, we tend to see this in the consecration of the myrrh, being removed away from the local bishop to the patriarchal level, which is in a sense undermining the proper fullness of each local church. Is a hierarchical divine liturgy of the Orthodox Church the only liturgy? Or no. is it the liturgy most manifest? This is the most manifest liturgy. It's not the only liturgy. So in, in the case of the Christ and the Apostles, Yes, the fullness of a representative is a Christ and the apostles, but each apostle leads his own church, just as each bishop leads his own church. Each apostle serves and is the image of Christ in, in his capacity. Each presbyter is the image of Christ in his own jurisdiction. And so when he offers, he offers as his place of Christ, just as a bishop does. He stands at the altar as the one Christ and the around him and gathered is the entire church. So he offers as priest. And interestingly, if you look at the custom of Constantinople, the bishop, when offering the liturgy in the ancient texts, removes all insignia of being a bishop when he makes the offering. He offers as a priest among priests. He is no higher as priest than the other presbyters around him. He is priest among priests. He stands as first and singular, but this is true in any presbyter offers with other presbyters. They stand on the side. There's only one that stands at the altar, the one of priority. But the bishop in ancient times took off at the reading of the gospel his omniphoria. So he kept it off until the time of communion because the order of communion is order of bishop then presbyters he then puts on his insignia to identify himself as a, as a bishop and or during or during times of ordination when he acts in his role as bishop but otherwise he serves as a presbyter among presbyters so in that sense all the presbyters are equal all liturgies are fully liturgies as per, as long as they're done in consent and unity with the bishop could you comment on a widespread notion that bishops are priests of priests. Again, I think that's sort of, I cover that a little bit in the, in the first things, that they're not, they're the first of uh, the arch priest, but they're not priests of priests in a sense. The ordination to each presbyter is equal. And again, when Christ ordains the apostles, the fullness of the rock is given to one, Peter, and then it's given to the others, equal. So each apostle, in a sense, is the full presence of Christ. And this, and that all the apostles are likewise given it equally. So Peter does not stand above them as ever had anything more as an authority of forgiveness of sins than the other apostles. He just stands there as a place of unity, uh, uh, that, that each actually has the entire, so we're not priests only by committee. We are priests each and of ourselves in unity with the one, which is the principle of St. Catherine of Carthage regarding St. Peter. So, yes, each presbyter stands equally as with the bishop. And this is why in the early church, the names of bishop and presbyters are interchangeable. The presbyters were bishops, the pres bishops were presbyters. The two are the same. The, the bishop only stands as first of the presbyters in a sense of uniting them. But, and, and his singular role means he is a singular place of ordination of the presbyters, consecration of the altar, and consecrating the myrrh for unity. But he doesn't stand as any higher as a uh, priesthood. And even in the ordination prayers, we do not see any extra priesthood being given to the bishop at his ordination. He's only set aside as a singular point among the presbyters, which is also why if he transgresses a bishop's ordination, as um, going uh, preaching in a diocese next door without permission, he's reduced to the rank of a presbyter without 
denying him his um, priestly role. His, his, his function as a bishop has been transgressed. So he just removed from that function. Um, and or if the schismatic comes in in the order of bishop, and if they are allowed to stay in order, they can sometimes put back as a presbyter without denying them being priests. And this is only possible if fundamentally they have equal the equality of presbyters and bishops as priests and rulers and teachers. <laughs> On a slightly odd related note, what are the limits of customs derived from orthodox cultural traditions outside the place of origin of those cultural traditions? For example, in the West, whatever that means, in the diasporas of traditionally orthodox ethnic uh, or cultural groups, what, uh, what principle of discernment can one use for what customs, such as long hair, short hair, beards, no beards, as it, uh, uh, the, not the perfect examples, <laughs> but how far can one carry customs that are derived from a culture of orthodox origin in a place outside that culture? Right. In principle, the or, um, customs that belong to a territory are not applicable or enforceable outside that territory. They belong to the territory, they belong to the synod of that territory. Now we've got two issues going on. If we're just talking about the, the principle of uh, uh, mission to, on, uh, to contiguous to the borders of one's um, territory, to lands and without uh, previous church hierarchical structures in them, then it's natural that the gospel comes with the cultural things. You can't really pull them apart immediately or instantaneously. You can't preach the gospel or give the liturgical without some form of embedded custom to it. But once the local church, or local area starts to be grounded in the faith and it, it, it should be, have its own local hierarchy established reasonably quickly, then that local hierarchy can, should be able to add, introduce its own local customs. It is not bound to the other customs. And if you are to bind the other customs, you're actually imposing the, the proper authority that's limited to region on another region. This is transgressing the principles of, of authority that a new mission should have. But for, it may be centuries that it may follow very closely to the customs of its mother church. This is quite natural. But it should not be forced upon it. It becomes its own right, its own customs, its own ways afterwards. In the case of what's going on in the West, we have a rather um, difficult situation in which, unfortunately, churches have no right really to be in the West are coming on and the churches are being divided by local custom. I want to go to Russian church because of a Russian custom or a Greek church because of Greek custom. This is really an anathema to the... the, the tradition of local rule, local authority, local customers. It, it is a sense of, uh, a, a, like a philatism. It, it is a contrary to the church of one in each place, all people coming together, and we should be following the rule of the local place. So in the places of the West, it would be unfortunately much better if there had been one um, patriarchate that had come. Yes, there would be a predominance of its customs, but the local clergy should be re-established here. And in the case of Western Europe, you have its own liturgical heritage, which proceeds from the fathers before the schism. And so there should be some acknowledgement that this was already received, it's already in place, that the synodical structure, the bishop's jurisdiction stuff, were already mapped out. And so the churches coming to look after this area should be recognized recognition of the tradition that was received there and uh, perhaps even they could help it to re revive it or, or grow it again so that, that, that it truly becomes a local church but this requires first establishing a local hierarchy. <laughs> Metropolitan Kalistos observes that in two places of historical Russian mission you have uh, as it were purer forms of Russian style worship than in Russia namely Alaska and Japan and he observes that cultural values in these two areas of historical Russian mission were such that the local people, while worshipping in the local language, would never dream of changing many things that you might consider custom that were not derived locally but from Russia, when indeed Russia itself was changing them. To what extent is the carryover custom legitimate? You commented on 
that it should not be imposed. But to what extent is it legitimate or should the local area develop its own customs deliberately? I think that the local, the principle is the local rule. And if the local church rulers um, want to maintain certain Russian customs, they are free to do so. However, in wisdom, that the local people coming to the church do not feel like they are becoming Russians, but they are remaining Japanese, but Orthodox Japanese. The wisdom dictates that local customs, local feel and stuff to represent Japanese culture, Japanese things, as far as it is consistent with the tradition of a church, should be developed into the church so that people feel at home as Japanese. And this is one of the biggest problems with Orthodox missions, sadly, in the West, is that quite often people are turning away from Orthodox churches because they feel they have to become Russian or Greek or Romanian and they can't remain English or French or, or whatever because they are coming into churches which are actually defined, the jurisdictions defined around their customs rather than just the tradition. So this is causing a problem to the church as a whole um, and it's witness and testament and the salvation of souls. So uh, while it, the local church is free to maintain particular customs from abroad, it's, it's many ways wise to try to open the door to, to be regionalized so the local people feel at home without having to be in a foreign country or a foreign nation qua your human nationality. As you know, my doctorate was dedicated to the condemnation of philatism and the canonical principle of territorial jurisdiction. However, a practical issue arises. Custom or tradition uh, is not an insistence on developing consciously and deliberately developing local customs characteristic of cultures that are that are already used to making their own decisions rather than receiving cultures where individuals are uh play a greater role than a community or even consumers than your principle uh of, of obedience that you articulated earlier would you say that there are special challenges to what you might call the postmodern urban West? Uh, yes, <laughs> there, we are, in a way, one of the issues is um, we are falling into a sense of individualism, which is um, also in a sense denial of um, the church sort of union principles. And um, one way of expressing this is that in the, older times and in this you sometimes see this in national costume where the costume of people was appropriate to a village so everyone in the village would wear a particular style of clothing everybody in a region would have a particular characteristic and this in this context we see a, a sense of custom which is a unifying it, it, it's it's one of identifying ourselves with one another it's not an imposition of a a singular will. It's a sort of a received community thing. And indeed, the, the sense of custom should be something that evolves at a, at a sort of organic community level rather than just simply uh, will of individuals <laughs> abstracted out into um, apart from the community. So I hope that sort of answers your question on that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Father Patrick and Father Alexander. I think we should now open the floor so other people can uh, ask questions as well. It's now already 20 to 9. So please, yeah, if you have questions, just raise your hand or, um, yeah. Uh, Christina? Um. It's not a question as such, uh, it's just a comment on this last discussion by Father Taft and Father, Father Patrick there. I'm English, I'm of the Church of Cyprus, my husband is the Archpriest of Tanzania, well, retired Archpriest, uh, Archpriest, of, uh, Archpriest of Tanzania in the Seychelles. And what we did in the Seychelles when we established the group there, 
first thing we did was to change the liturgy into Creole, which is the language. Here, I rarely hear the liturgy in English or any other any other um, service. I have no objection at all to taking on the customs of the Greek or the Russian, but I would just so love to have the opportunity and freedom within my church, which I believe is just as much my church as any other ethnic group, to hear it in English in England. I don't expect to hear it in English in Cyprus or in the Seychelles, but I do would love to hear it. But I know that the priests are fighting the arch the, the, the new um, archbishop on this. Where is the authority there? Who has that? And if, if they're fighting him, what does that do to his authority? Um, would you like? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Throw that bomb in. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's look. Yeah, look, it gets things get quite tricky um, in in the way of what's going on with the Orthodox churches in the UK. Quite a lot of the churches um, are sort of seeing themselves simply as being a sort of um, exarch that's looking after a um, this the diaspora, and therefore. The Greek church, in some ways, um, is to find itself as we're here to look after people from Greece, and we're here to keep them in touch with the church in their own cultural context. And so, what's happening is a lot, of, and a lot of the Greek people in the UK, um, the church has become their cultural home. It is a place where once a week they can be Greek and not have to be Russian. So the last thing they want. Is someone to say, come and say, oh, I'm an Englishman standing in the back of here. Could you have it in English, please? Because this is this is a cultural problem for that. So, so a lot of the, this is what's happening is that a lot of the bishops and hierarchs are sent simply as a sort of to again look after a cultural group mm -hmm. and define themselves. Now, what needs to take place is the establishment of a local hierarchy here. But there is an issue, too, about the relationship between churches. To do so is to deny that the Roman Catholics are the church or the Anglicans are the church. And this, because of the particular relations now, this is a step that some are refusing, not really comfortable with taking. Um, and so only once you really get a local church, which starts developing with local hierarchy here, that the church becomes the local church in the UK, then with the the hierarchy itself want to have that everything in English, etc. And ideally, they should take over all the Russian, Serbian parishes, etc., under their their ring. Allow them to continue to use Greek if that's what the majority of the people there are. But in the context that the, the actual church as a whole has a provision of everything in English for the local people, so that you, 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 the English is the primary language. But this really needs a, the church to commit to local hierarchs here who are established in this country and ideally chosen from this country who feel in the needs and understand the culture and not someone coming over to look up. So this still needs to be worked out at, at a hierarchy, what exactly they're there to do, what's their purpose going on. So there's still a lot of bits of mixed messages and stuff. So I think that's mudding the waters of really being able to find an easy answer to this. Father Patrick, yep. not all Orthodox theologians uh, embrace the idea that the bishop represents Christ, as the idea of a vicarius Christi, um, because it clashes with the model of the church as the body of Christ. If the bishop is part of the body of Christ, he cannot represent Christ. And uh, an alternative is to view both the hierarchy as well as the lay vocation as an internal differentiation of the body of Christ. Because the model that you suggest can easily lead to clericalism. In the negative uh, sense, you know, um, it's not uh, that the hierarchy is, is not important, but uh, as I said, it's not at all the case. This is not just orthodox doctrine that the bishop represents Christ in the way he described it. Yeah, well, I'm fine. Um, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, who actually makes makes this point, so that 
Um, is, it the best, also, is it the, the best model, Ignatius? It's not the most developed ecclesiology we have, not at all. Well, you'll find that in the theotic relations that actually everything is Christ. The whole body is Christ. It's not a denial of that. It's within that structure that each that Christ was presented in through the theotic relations, either in the husband is fully Christ to his wife, um, the Christ and the husband is, is fully Christ to their parent, their children, the children to, to the animals and people around them. Christ is fully present in all the structure. But there's a different levels and hierarchies that we distinguish the role of Christ in, in different manners. So the bishop has a sort of a single union of the present the mystery of Christ and the apostles, but the, each presbyter is fully Christ, God to his and to his, um, his parish. And in a sense, yes, the clergy and their authority is essential to the church. It's, it's with this authority, this, this union with the clergy that we come to union with Christ. We can't do so apart from that. It's not a lay organization. It's a, it's a, it's a God-led organization. But Christ is truly present in all parts in fullness. And um, the hierarchical structure is there to bring it all into unity to Christ and to reflect Christ as in his divine capacity to humanity. And this can't be done in a democratic sense. It reduced the church to simply a human organization, a democratic organization, and it would lose its ability to unite with Christ as God. So this is why I, I think yes. it's very important to have this happen. But, you know, the model, if you understand hierarchy and, and the lay vocation as an internal differentiation of the body of Christ, does not mean that the hierarchy cannot have a, spe a specific function. It does not mean that the hierarchy doesn't have a certain authority which lay people don't have. But it's, it's a fundamental difference if it is an internal differentiation or whether the bishop represents Christ. It's just a completely different approach. And the second aspect, you know, you were often talking about marriage in terms of uh, understood on the basis of Ephesians L, uh, 5 as um, Christ and the church, but you find in the church for other models as well. For instance, St. John Chrysostom also compares husband and wife with uh, God the Father and the Son. And because this obviously excludes any kind of subordinationism, which would be heresy, and he applies this too, to uh, husband and wife, which um, at least relativizes the, the uh, asymmetry in the relationship. So it's by no means the, the only model we find in, um, in, in the tradition to understand the relationship between uh, husband and wife. Yes, so we, we work both uh, that the, um, we affirm that there is an asymmetry in the relationship, which is quite clear in, in um, St. Paul, and also that they are of equal dignity. So we can, we can affirm and speak of the husband and wife in equal dignity. And in the age to come, they stand equally before God. There is no ranking of male and female in, in the age to come. It is, it is it's something here as a symbolic nature for the union of man with God. And so whatever model we have, we recognize both parts and not in opposition to each other, or that these theories of opposition, they both work with each other. And so the theotic relation model affirms both the sense of the equality and equal dignity of a male and female, and at the same time of the asymmetric role in leading to theosis, which is clearly expressed in Ephesians, as you, as you point out. These are not contrary models, they are the, the different aspects of the same reality. Any other questions? That doesn't seem to be the case. Then, uh, oh, Father Alexander, any any final comments? Just one observation about the question of asymmetry. I don't know whether this applies to abbots and priests and bishops, vis-a-vis -vis monks and laity or lower orders. Uh, but it certainly applies to husband and wife. If you read further in Ephesians 5, you did touch upon this, but you didn't really uh, elaborate it. Is it truly asymmetrical, perhaps asymmetrical, not necessarily unparalleled? If Paul calls upon the wife to submit to the husband as the church does to Christ, 
he calls upon the husband to lay down his life for the wife as Christ does for the church. Doesn't that create a certain symmetry, a symmetry of uh, self-sacrifice, if not a symmetry of exterior position? Uh, is, the, is, it, is symmetry always an imbalance or, or rather asymmetry? Does that mean an imbalance or does that mean a contrast? Uh, it, it, it occurs to me that, uh, again, in connection with my questions after the first presentation, as soon as you get into the complexities of everyday life, of life Sunday by Sunday and feast by feast, of relationships among fallen human beings, things get much, much more complicated. Yes. Well, again, if I... Um, uh, May that the um, the relate all oh, the principle is that both are equal, both are an image of God, and both come to theosis, which is the rule, common rule of God. Thus, in in many aspects, they they are completely. They both sacrifice. They they both um, uh, are an image of God. They both Christ. They both give love and sacrifice. So, as far as their human. Um, City as a human being, they're both living the same spiritual life. We all come to Christ as in the same way. We all have the same Christ to which we are united. We all have to grow in the same virtues, etc. So the asymmetry does not apply to human being qua human being. It applies to the gut rule of governance, the, the sense of authority. It's there so that there can be one will through the process of obedience. But it's nothing to do with saying that the man and woman are not equal as human beings or both sacrifice and they do anything like this. It's an asymmetry to bring to unity of mind, unity of will through the fall, through the disobedience of man in the first place. This is set up to bring back the unity of will to that we may both, we may all co-rule we may all sacrifice, we may all do this together, but the asymmetry still allow this to happen. So because man needs to go into obedience to God since he's thrown it away from disobedience in the first place. And so this is this asymmetry only applies in this case. It's not to say that men and women are any less equal <laughs> in, in, in dignity as man and woman. And this is why the, the field of relations part of that is, is the full respect of that equality, that real rule, that real authority, and everything according to jurisdiction, to according to your space, to your, your place. Um, and it's, it's not about anyone being superior to another as a human being. Good, thank you. I think it's time now to draw this discussion to a close. I would like to thank both Father Patrick and Father Alexander for their uh, contributions and uh, also the audience for your questions. And we hope uh, to welcome you back soon for our next uh, community day. I, at the moment, I'm, I don't remember the exact date, but you, you'll find it on our website. It's about spiritual guidance. It will be Father Dimitrios Pathrelos and Father uh, Livio. I think it's at the end of April, if I'm okay. But you'll find all the information on our website. Okay, I wish you a good night and thank you again. Bye-bye.